The next day started nice. It was fun to explore the little communities in our approach to Robinson's River. I always found that area beautiful, but before long we were climbing. We also came across a long flooded section that proved to be the worst of the entire journey. My biking buddy filmed me through this. And there were just bogs and barns that went on forever. Eventually, the track reaches a high point where there's a skidoo warm-up shelter. And then the track descends into black spruce. This section seemed to go on forever. Not as scenic as the previous day. Very few signs posted. It's all too easy to confuse the trailway with woods roads in this section. Then we seem to encounter a Groundhog Day section. There'd be a large pond to our left, a slight left turn and a rise. That happened three times. I was getting tired for something new. I found out later that these ponds were called Big Rushy Pond, Rushy Pond, Flat Bay Pond. Then suddenly we're crossing Flat Bay Road. Next it was Flat Bay Brook Bridge. And finally we get to the houses in St. George's. My biking buddy uses his phone to find a spot to buy lunch. And we pick up sandwiches and wraps and desserts at Central Service Station on Main Street in St. George's. From there, it gets a little bit more interesting and approach to Stephenville Crossing. I like seeing Mattis Point and the bottom of Bay St. George. Bicycling through Stephenville Crossing was busy. It was a warm day and there was traffic and pedestrians moving about. But that was short-lived and we were back into the bogs and barrens again. This went on for ages. We eventually arrived at some sparse cabin seemingly in the middle of nowhere. My buddy struck up a conversation with a man who told us that scenery was going to improve as we headed further east. It did improve in a way. There were more trees, but the going seemed to get rougher. At one point, the ballast had washed away, leaving just large beach rocks that were even a challenge for my fat bike tires. Then it suddenly became a sensible dirt road, good enough for a regular car, and the trees got really big. I glanced to my right and saw a river. Was this Harry's River? Yes, it was. We were getting close to Glance and George's Lake. There was a logging operation around Glance, so the road's in great shape. But on the other side of Glance, it got rough again and dark. We passed a few salmon fishermen, and then we're out to George's Lake. The lake is way bigger than I expected and took ages to bicycle the length of it. We're getting tired, but my buddy kept going, and we found a high spot north of the lake to pitch the tent. It was the first time I crawled into my sleeping bag without getting a bath first. I was packed a little faster than my buddy, and so I waited patiently, taking in the morning summer air and wondering what views I would take in that day. As soon as my buddy joined me, I took off with surprising energy. The descent was surprisingly steep, especially given that the old Victorians tried their best to have a shallow grade up or down. We stopped briefly on our way down at wonderfully clear brook to fill our water bottles, and then we shot on again. Visually, it felt like I was going up after the brook, but all the charts tell me otherwise. Actually, my speed should have also been an indicator that it was all downhill past Cook's Pond, Little Cook's Pond, and into Mount Moriah. The trailway then gets sketchy as it works through curling into Cornerbrook and up the Humber Valley. This is the worst spot on the entire trail for it being covered up, paved over, or claimed by aggressive developers. We take a slight detour to Tim Hortons on the Valley Mall parking lot for a second breakfast. It's always good to feed your body when exerting it so much with long hours of bicycling. We stop briefly at the train display in Hummermouth and continue on the TCH. We stay on the TCH until the overpass at Humber Village between Steady Brook and Little Rapids. Then there's a dirt bike trail adjacent to the TCH on the right that eventually takes us through Little Rapids. Then we pass under an overpass onto a dirt road at Boom Siding. That dirt road goes all the way to Pasadena, which we ride through. This section was the old Trans-Canada Highway back in the 1980s. At the end of Pasadena, we go under yet another overpass at the uh, intersection there, and the trailway emerges once again. However, this section was really overgrown. It isn't until later in the summer that someone clears the encroaching alders and grades it. All I remember of this section at the time are just two deep trenches and alders hitting me. It seems to go on forever, and given my fatigue, even slight inclines feel exhausting to pedal. We get up to a quarry, and I snap a picture of a brave little fox sunning and grooming himself. From there, I take a wrong turn and head into a cul-de-sac at the end of Taylor Estates. I make my way out of it and back into familiar territory towards St. Jude's. We cross back under the TCH, and I'm back home in Deer Lake. It rains the next day, Thursday, and so we hunger down at the house to recuperate. We start out early as usual, and my spirits are quite high, as I know at least 50% of the journey today, and I know my biking buddy will appreciate the sights. 
I talk a lot this morning sharing my local knowledge, although my familiarity with this area only goes back a few months. It's generally a climb heading out of Deer Lake. It doesn't level off until you reach Northern, an old siding near the canal intake. My buddy has never seen the 1925 main dam and stops to take pictures down in Junction Brook looking up at the dam. We push our bikes up out of the gorge and head toward Howley. That section is mostly bog until you get down close to Grand Lake where it gets more scenic and sandy. In fact, there's about a 200 meters of sand that you cannot pedal through, so we end up pushing our bikes for a second time that morning. We continue on through Holly and then the long, boring section of a very straight trailway through the boreal forest. That's a nearly 20 kilometer section that are almost no distinguishing features, just track and trees. But then there are a couple of bends in the road and the land drops away to our left as we climb into Kitty's Brook. Kitty's Brook is just magical. It's a tight little valley with mountain ridges seemingly within arm's reach. It feels like you're in a movie set. It's so quaint and picturesque and it has such a variety in foliage. I guess it's why they call it a microclimate. It certainly doesn't seem to get much wind, as it feels very sheltered. We chat briefly to two couples and their quads and side-by-sides who ask us where we've come from and where we're headed at the first trestle. At the second trestle, what's known as Kitty's East, we stop at a natural spring for lunch. This was a great idea. It was now midday and we're halfway to Millertown Junction, and it was the end of my knowledge. I hadn't been in this area since riding the train for real back in the late 1970s. We took our time to eat, bowl water for coffee. I quite enjoyed the second part of the day. The incline seemed less pronounced. We winded our way up past the chain lakes, and I picked up a railway spike here as a souvenir of my trailway adventure. The terrain gradually transforms into barrens, and later there are a few cabins at Pond Crossing, and further again, more cabins at Gaff Topsail. The actual tolt of Gaff Topsail is a pronounced bald hill pushing out of the barrens. The tolt is visible from quite a distance on the approach, and you seem to come at it from the back. The trail feels like it bends slightly to the right, so then you can see the front of the gaff too. Strangers pass us here on their ATVs, and the section's quite straight. We pass a sign that reads Summit with some details in elevation and distance to St. John's. We pass a place called Quarry, where they cut the massive granite stones from many of the trestle supports for all the streams and rivers along the way. Then the trail descends slightly. We pass Mary March River, and the surrounding gets more trees. Then there's an incredibly long straight section on approach to Millertown Junction. The trees continue to grow in size and eventually takes us into cabin country and Joe Glode's Pond. Too tired to pitch our tent, I volunteer to walk up to the Junction Lodge and I tap on their door. I have to do this a couple of times to get some attention. Through a bit of a delay, the operator agrees to put us up for the night, 30 bucks each. We agreed to the offer. Turns out to be owned by Mont Lingard, the writer of the Next Stop series of books on the Newfoundland Railway. We're able to get a good shower and a cozy bed for the night.